Oh, he's back. <laughs> do you want to do your introduction? I don't even know what I'm saying, so go ahead. Wait, let, hold on a second. Relationship with this technology, and as I keep telling folks that we do not just use technology, but technology also uses us. So I tend to be, you know, the kind of victim of what I call technostrophy. But anyway, can you hear me all right? Or? Yeah. Okay. Yes, we, Sorry. we can hear you. And, and uh, Najla just asked if you if you would would still like to do your introduction that you had sure. Sure. Would you okay. allow me to do that so that I can talk yeah, about? Yeah, no, I'd love for you to do it because I was All just right. babbling. All right. Okay. So I have to introduce myself because some of the people who don't know me here, you know, I mean, who are also watching this show from outside. I'm Asfar Hussein, and I'm vice president of the Global Center for Advanced Studies, and also a GCS professor of English, world literature, and interdisciplinary studies. It is, it is indeed, indeed, a great pleasure to to have Nazla Saeed with us, our guest, the Palestinian, Lebanese, American writer, artist, playwright, actor, director, activist, Nazla Saeed. We are very, very excited that she is with us and she has already started discussing her 2013 book, her memoir called Looking for Palestine, Growing Up Confused in an Arab American Family. And I should also mention here right away that uh, my brief introduction to Nazla Saeed will not do justice to the entire range of her work and accomplishments, but I will underline a few crucial points, a few points that I find crucial while providing certain information about her life and her work. Indeed, to speak of Nazla Saeed is to speak of a vibrant, engaged, and even empowering voice for second generation Arab Americans across the United States. A voice that does not represent but relates and relates stories, stories of struggle, stories that are personal yet not so personal, stories that have their own ways of making connections and forging solidarities. Yes, the author of Looking for Palestine, Growing Up Confused in an Arab American family, a storyteller in her own right, in fact, reminds me of my favorite Palestinian poet, Mahmoud Darwish, who once put it this way, I quote, I don't decide to represent except myself, but that self is full of collective memory, unquote. Indeed, Nazla Saeed, to me, seems to be enacting and even performing that very politically significant dialectic between the personal and the collective, for Nazla Saeed is not only a memoir writer whose verbal zest is unmistakable indeed, but also a playwright and actor for whom, as she once put it in an interview, acting itself is a way of empowering her voice. Indeed, she has appeared in numerous plays, in film, and on television. And I can't go into all those details here, owing to time constraints. But a few more words about our guest, Nazla Saeed. Born in Boston, Nazla Saeed graduated from Princeton and trained in New York City at the Shakespeare Lab at the Public Theater, the Actors Center. She is a founding member of the Arab American Theater Collective called Nivras, and she has been described as one of New York's usual suspects. Her play called Palestine is a fabulously popular one-woman show that debuted off Broadway in February 2010. To put it quickly and roughly, the play Palestine is a coming-of-age story about Saeed's journey to become an Arab American on her own terms, making the point that identity itself is never in a state of being, but always in a process of becoming. I should also point out that Nazla Saeed was named one of the top 40 feminists under 40 by the feminist press in the year 2010. Last, but by no means least, Nazla Saeed, as you already know, and I need to repeat this though, this repetition being necessary, Nazla Saeed is the daughter of the 20th century's leading 
literary and cultural theorist as well as public intellectual Edward Said and the daughter of Mariam Said who has been described as a sophisticated, outstanding and loving human being. To the extent that her book Looking for Palestine is about Nazla Said herself, it is also about the people who matter to her and among them, yes, one must mention emphatically indeed Edward Said and Maryam Said. You have already been welcome to our yeah. you know, uh, class, and so we can you can you can continue your talk. But I, that I was babbling pretty much, but that was beautiful. Thank you. Um, yeah. I was just I just explained the genesis of the play and the sure. book and who I wrote it for, which um, and I had said that when I was growing up, I had had I felt very much. Like I wasn't a part of the world that I lived in, and there was no one like me in any of the books that I read. And I mentioned that all I read was Toni Morrison, and how I would read The Bluest Eye again and again, and books like that. And Jane Eyre, I was obsessed with Jane Eyre, which now I realize also. I mean, the idea that she was an outcast and and everyone hated her. That's how I felt always as a, as a little girl. Um, and so when my editor had encouraged me to turn this into a book specifically for young people um, dealing with similar identity issues, I, that's what made me want to write it because I had wished I had something like it. And I did worry and I, and I have worried and it has been clear that some people um, will say things like, well, she's just a rich, spoiled girl who grew up with famous scholars in her house and it really makes me angry <laughs> for a few reasons. One is that I'm not sure what the benefit would be of my pretending to be born in a refugee camp um, you know, and, and, and having struggled in a way that I didn't struggle. I don't know what the benefit of that would be. Um, what, I, what I was able to, um, to, to sort of conclude was important about my story was even I have struggled with my father's work in the in the academic sense and in the in school and and the difficulty of reading that kind of um, I know you guys are all brilliant genius scholars but for the lay person his ideas are equally I mean they're easily accessible and I was able and my brother was able and everyone around us has been able to access them without having to read sure. um, these books and so I thought well if I can understand everything that he stood for and everything that he did, then everyone else will be able to, too. So I wanted to sort of humble myself and be like, I didn't understand this either. I was stupid. I didn't care. Um, and I point that out very clearly because I didn't have to care. Um, and then I began this journey of talking about it growing up, and I was explaining this um, just before the introduction. You know, I... Like, as, ironically, my father was writing Orientalism, and I was watching TV, wondering why I didn't look like a little brown person who got down on her knees and, and like, I don't know, prayed, I don't know, whatever, that I'd see on TV, and, or, you know, um, it wasn't this sexy girl in harem pants. I just was a mess, and I thought that mm -hmm. I wasn't like anyone. And so I was born in 74, and the Civil War in Lebanon started a year later, and then I started kindergarten in 79, which was the year of the Iran hostage crisis, and then I was caught in Lebanon as a, as a little girl in 1983, and then it was the intifada when I was in 7th and 8th grade, my dad was on TV all the time, and then in high school, it was the Gulf, first Gulf War, so I couldn't escape all of these um, sort of history, these history was happening, and I had to constantly you know, I was embarrassed and ashamed because it seemed like I was supposed to hate Arab because I was American, but then I was completely proud and in love with my family and I felt safe and warm and I just kept getting more and more confused and I thought, well, if these two worlds don't, if what I'm being told here is one thing, what I'm feeling at home is another thing and I can't reconcile these two things, I'm just going to be American. And I think after 1983 when I, we got stuck in Lebanon and then we didn't go back we escaped and then we didn't go back for another almost 10 years, I just resigned myself to, like, I'm not interested in that, I don't want anything to do with that, meaning the Middle East. So I let it go and then 
um, as I was saying, when I first began, I, I, you can't really escape it, and I didn't realize until um, I was, you know, growing older, and I was starting to understand the world more, and just having been raised by this, Amer this amazing set of parents who were, like, staunchly secular and humanist, it was very difficult for me to um, just go through life allowing um, this stuff to be happening and not speaking out. So uh, I think that, however, I've never been interested in history or politics. <laughs> I'm an actress. I'm an artist. And I that's what I've gotten from my dad. And um, so I thought, well, I'm, I'm going to try to figure out how to talk about this in the language that I know. And the language that I know is theater. And that was the way that I was able to um, go about learning about this massive subject. And um, my goal is just simply to help other people understand it. Um, I don't have any solutions. And I think one of the, the best pieces of theater and literature don't leave you with answers. They leave you with questions. And that's what I wanted to do I was just because people always ask, so now now that you've done this, now that you've written this, now that you've sure. done this play, who are you? And I still don't have an answer. I mean, I don't know that there is an answer. And, um, you know, the fact that, like, I wrote this play, I called it Palestine, and then I got an award from a feminist organization it was just bizarre. You know, it just depends on how you look at things. Um, you know, I mean, I'm, of course, grateful and happy and excited, but I didn't, I wrote stuff that was, I guess, can be perceived as feminist because of the fact that I was born in the United States of America at a certain time and I had a strong mother who was certainly a feminist, but I didn't set out to be a feminist. So in the same sense, like, I don't know what I'm, whether asserting my identity means that I'm saying, oh, now I'm, now I'm saying I'm Palestinian because mm -hmm. I still don't know what that is. And I still think that I'm Palestinian, Lebanese, American, something. I mean, I'm, I don't know what it is. And I have no answer, and I don't think I ever will. And the more I do these kinds of events, the more I'm confused about even my career because I, I wanted to be an actress, <laughs> and I am an actress. But now I've also become a playwright and a a writer, a book writer, and I also teach Pilates. I don't know. There's a million things that I am, and I feel like trying to categorize them, uh, or give them like certain a sort of hierarchy of which is the most me and and which is you know, because, and then often it just comes back to, you know, you're Edward Said's daughter anyway, so <laughs> that's the most frustrating one, so, um, yeah, so I don't know, that's really all I was going to say, I don't have much else to add. Is that why you emphasize uh, <clears throat> Pilates instructor on your on your Facebook as opposed to um, actress or, or writer, is it, because uh, you're kind of questioning this idea of, of like, one-dimensional roles or, or representations? Well, what happens with Facebook is I think that people seek me out a lot because I'm my father's daughter, which is fine. It's totally flattering. But then they, this has happened, they get mad at me because I'll write, like, why is Justin Bieber, you know, drinking? And, and then they're like, why are you writing about such frivolous things? And I'm like, well, I don't know. What am I supposed to write about? I, I think that that's part of it, is they want me to be somebody um, that they've decided I am. And then they, then there's this this entire thing about who my father is and was. And I, I don't think that, you know, anybody who didn't know him can ever know who he is. And, and I think that he would, one of the things that's really important to know about my dad, and, and my mom and I are always having to stress this, is that he didn't believe in, like, disciples. He didn't believe in people like just worshipping him. And he wanted students to disagree with him. He wanted people to have their own ideas and their own thoughts and their own... So that this this whole thing, it, it's sort of loathsome and it's also, you know, Arabs have, have decided he's a certain person and Americans who are activists have decided he's a certain person and represents a certain thing and then intellectuals have decided and I, you know, my father he was, I mean, he was as bizarre as anyone. I mean, Showgirls was his favorite movie. I mean, he was just, a, he was a human being, of course, but, like, he had as many things, you know, people always talk about that, like, movies. Like, did he like this movie? And they'll bring up something very 
um, intellectual, and he, I was like, I'll say no. He hated those movies. He liked really bad Hollywood movies. He liked Die Hard, and he like he didn't want to see like I, I don't know. That's just and that's the thing that um, you end up asserting all these peculiarities about someone like that because everyone's decided who he is, and so I think that that was also really important to me, and um, so yeah. That's pretty much all. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you very much. That was that was really fascinating. Um, <laughs> I, I mean, I, I have a number of questions, uh, but I'm sure uh, Osfar has a few, and uh, other students have a few. Let uh, um, let students ask some questions first, and maybe. Okay. Yeah. Maybe, yeah. All right. Yeah. Let's do that. Um, I mean, I, well, what I mean is, I have students who have sent me questions that they want me to pose. But let's start with, with let's start with a live student who's who's here right. in the hangout. Mm -hmm. Can you hear me? Can I? Can you hear me? Um, yeah. Um, Najla. Yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, I was wondering if I could ask you a question. My name is Wan Young. Um, hi. And um, hi. It was great to hear you talk. And um. I can relate. I found myself relating to so much of it because my father is an intellectual as well. Um, he was recently um, widely recognized for something he did with um, his work on cancer cures, and um, I, I'm interested in philosophy, and that's just something that my parents don't identify with because they're scientists. Right. So um, this whole issue of identity, like people are always, you know, imposing labels on us. And um, do you think it can ever be defined, or is it something that we just um, blend into other um, other norms, or it's just a very amorphous thing? Well, I think it is amorphous. I, I don't know. I think that, and I, I also speak about this a little bit in the book, which is more something that I got from my dad, of course, because I don't, because I, I think one of the things that confused me about him was he was always making sure that we knew we were Palestinian and we asserted we were Palestinian and that we were proud of that identity, but at the same time, he was very much against political correctness in terms of speaking out and always saying, you know, I'm an African American, I'm an Asian American, because he would, he would always point out to me at the time when it was very popular, in that sense, you're, you're removing yourself from society, you're sort of separating yourself out. So, I often had this discussion with him about like where's the middle ground and and what he discusses I have a quote in the book from an interview that we did with him with my theater company and he said you know like the problem is the way that America has sort of been created as in a you know melting pot where mm -hmm. you know if you think about a place like England um, first of all in England there are a lot of Lebanese or whatever Arab Arab or Lebanese people who are also <laughs> English who live in England and they're English but they're also wherever their parents are from um, because that society doesn't ask you to choose it's sort of like you can be both somehow and I think that in the book the thing I quote my father quote that Canada is being similar the mosaic of like okay you're from this place but you're, you're part of this country now so you can be both whereas America it sort of forces you to like if you don't um, want to be America above all else, American, and if you don't want to say Arab American, <laughs> then you're somehow against America. And if you don't, and if you, and if you don't want to say Arab American, then you're somehow like, you know, doing a disservice. Yeah. To America. It seems um, they always think in terms of this or that. It's not. This or this or something else, you know? It's very like right. I would say like if you're if you're like an African American lesbian poet dancer. I mean, how? Wh why are you supposed to pick which one? I mean, just because they're all sort of marginalized identities, um, you could identify with one more than another or none of them. You know, exactly. You can have a person. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you, thank you, Wen Young. Uh, yeah. It looks like uh, uh, Chase turned on his camera, uh, so I'm guessing you you may be ready with a question, Chase. Yeah, is that okay? Absolutely. Uh, very good to see you, uh, Najla. Uh, thank Hi. you for your for your talk. Hi. Um, 
you concluded your talk with what I think is one of the most fundamental philosophical questions, I think, and that is of, of, of who, who am I as, as a person. And um, the, mo the, the, the famous Brazilian theater director, Augusto Boal, said that we must all do theater to find out who we are and to di discover who we could become. So mm -hmm. my question is, to what extent was theater that for you? And I, I also like to add to this question, you also mentioned that history and politics was something you, you kept quite away from, in it, as I understood it, right? And wow. is, aren't these exactly the disciplines that may help you discover that who you are on the most fundamental level? Yeah. These are. Uh, why, it's interesting, it's two points um, that I am really happy to address. Um, thank you for asking about theater. Um, it's very important in terms of um, my journey because of the fact that, and this is sort of chronicled in the book, when I was a little girl, uh, partly probably because I was so sh sort of lost and confused and I heard a different language at home than I heard at school and um, whatever, I was very shy and very quiet. I mean, I would just listen and observe and daydream. And so I... Because I was so shy, especially with adults, my parents, I think it, it might have been my father, actually, had this idea that maybe if I did theater classes, I would sort of open up. And I went to these after-school theater classes when I was eight. and Because they realized that I was very creative, and I was always telling stories and writing stories and pretending. And so they thought, well, she has this incredible imagination, but she's shy, so maybe if she went on stage. So I took these after-school theater classes, and... The teacher, the guy who ran the program, put me, gave me the lead part on the first, um, the first class, and I just jumped on stage and became this other person, um, and I loved it, and that was it. And then from then on, I wanted to be on stage, and so I always would insist that I love drama, I love drama, what I want to do, and it was sort of a way of standing out from my family that's mostly intellectuals for a mm -hmm. long time. But then when I was able to put things together in a different way, I realized that. It was um, it was it was similarly profound because um, you know when I went to college I studied comparative literature and theater, and I couldn't major in theater at Princeton. You have to do like a it has to be like a joint program. So I did comparative literature with theater play. Like I wrote about Genet and Beth, and so I decided um, I. I decided to, I wrote my thesis in college on meta theater and how like these characters are assuming roles and, 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 and then on stage there's like, you know, whether it's Beckett, my idea I guess, which is not really very original, but I was a senior in college, what do I know, um, was that, you know, we always say that you watch, theater is supposed to imitate life, but reality is that, but he, his idea was that, um, life is basically theater. You're just making stuff up. There's nothing, we're just making, giving everything significance and meaning and it's all, we don't know what the hell we're doing here. We're just making it up and it's all like a big play. And then Janae, I, I loved because you, you watch the play and you get dizzy. It's like if a play like The Maze, everyone had like 17 different identities at one point. And I think that that's when it clicked for me. Um, as Cornell West recently said to me, it was all there. It was all there. You just hadn't figured it out yet. Uh, that like this idea of having different identity, um, this was it was possible to be on stage and be you could be a fat old man and a young skinny little girl at the same time because you were one body and this is sort of like Anna Devere Smith is a huge idol of mine and this is what her work does as well. She plays all these different people in one body and she's a light skinned black woman and she makes all these these incredible points about race and culture and identity just by in one body representing all the different characters that she does. And I think that there was something in that for me. Where I could go on stage and I could be everything that I was and it was okay. Because in my world it would be, Oh you're Arab, so you're Muslim and I'd say, No, I'm not Muslim oh, you're, um, you know, you're this, so you should be that. And I, and it was always, I was always wrong. I was always something, you know, you're Christian, you should be 
Eastern Orthodox. And I was like, no, we're Anglican and Quaker. You know, my mom's family was Quaker. I just didn't fit in in any way. Like, I was always something weird, even my Arabness. And yet I felt like my parents were completely Arab at the same time. So for me, theater was a huge part of that because, um, you know, and I'm not to be too, like, dramatic and existential about my life, but I think then I also write in the play about this journey with having an eating disorder and and linking the anorexia to my disconnect from the Middle East and wanting to at once disappear and also be noticed in the sense of, like, as a Palestinian even, almost, or as a woman. And then when I was in acting school, they were very harsh with me about having this eating disorder and they were like you need to deal with taking up space as a woman you need to understand that like you can't just like get skinny and hide in the corner and apologize for your existence and so it was a very feminist thing but it also struck me in a cultural way you know as a Palestinian I I'm like oh I'm sorry I'm not supposed to be here I'm the bad person you know growing up with Jewish people you know in New York City and always constantly being like, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to do anything, don't hate me. Um, and so that was also um, a very a very interesting and important thing for me as well was when I was getting better from that eating disorder was learning about why I constantly felt I wanted to at the same time disappear into someone else but also be noticed, which is pretty much what you do when you're an actor. So. Um, all of those things um, contributed a lot into my development as a person. And then the, the ultimate thing, I guess, was telling this, writing this play and telling this story because ultimately I was defining myself. Which, at first, when people used to start, when people used to ask me about my father's work and how it, it um, influenced me, I would say, well, I'm telling my own story. That's what he said we should do. And essentially, it's sort of a way that I was able to, um, I guess, like, as I said earlier, like, this is my mode of communication as a person. And this goes to your second question about history and politics. I have always, um, I have always, you know, the way that history and, and that stuff was taught in school, I just thought it was boring. I don't know. I, I like stories, and I always liked stories. I wanted to hear stories. So if it was a movie or a book that took place in a historical time, I was fine. But if it was facts and numbers, and I would get very anxious about not being able to remember. That's not the way, I, you know, we all have different brains, and that's not how my brain works. So I was always able to identify with personal stories, which... I think is why I was um, drawn to literature and theater. And so I think also that's how my father approached it as well, if you think about it, because he he was a, a literary scholar, but his his approach he would always read everything in context, but he was still the story he was was what he was drawn to, or the writing or the and then he would take it out of that and look at the, you know, the social significance or the cultural significance or the writer's life or whatever. But it was, it was the the, the starting point was always an interest in the story, and that's I think how it, that's how I was able to find my way into understanding history and politics. Um, so it was more like, the, you know, that's the boring subject at school that I don't care about, um, which. It, it may say more about education than anything else because it, I just didn't feel like I was being taught in a way that I was interested. And the idea of memorizing facts and numbers is very, I'm just not very good at that. That's very, very good, Najila. Thank you very much. That shows a lot of light. And you're very much in the line of young, you know, what we call young post-colonial diaspora writers like Jhumpa Lahiri. Yes. Sweetie, would you be so sweet as to read some one part that really affects you from your book, something just dramatize and read for a minute or two? Um, sure. I have to get the book. It's in the other room. You just okay. hang on. Talk amongst yourselves. I'll be right back. That'll be lovely. Thank you. Do you want to hear something that um, that about being Arab or just something else? Like whatever touches you the most. Whatever you think was the tenderest spot for you. Um. All right. Well, there's two different things. There's a couple things that I could say. I could read about my. I should probably just read to you guys about my 
dad or my parents. Hold on. Because, you know, I learned a lot. I never knew that your dad was Christian. I always thought they were Muslim. Yeah. I mean, he was totally secular, so he wouldn't yeah. know his religion, but I think a lot of people assume that. Um, let me just see. Sorry. I wasn't prepared for this. Can you hold the book up? Sure. Oh, it's lovely. Lovely, right, thank I'll, you. I'll just read from the beginning because that's my one of my favorite places okay. to read from. Um, okay. I am a Palestinian Lebanese American Christian woman, but I grew up as a Jew in New York City. I began my life, however, as a wasp. I was born in Boston to an Ivy League literature professor and his wife baptized into the Episcopal Church at the age of one, and at five sent to an all-girls private school on the Upper East Side of Manhattan, one that boasts among its alumni such perfectly formed and well-groomed American blue bloods as the legendary Jacqueline Onassis. It was at that point that I realized that something was seriously wrong with me. With my green seersucker tunic, its matching bloomers worn underneath for gym and dance classes, the white Peter Pan collar of my blouse, and my wool's knee socks, I was every bit the shape and school girl. I was proud of my new green blazer with its fancy school emblem and my elegant shoes from France. But even the most elaborate uniform could not protect against my instant awareness of my differences. I was a dark-haired rat in a sea of blonde perfection. I didn't live on the Upper East Side, where everyone else in my class seemed to live, but on the Upper West Side, or rather, so far beyond the boundaries of what was then considered the Upper West Side as to be unacceptable to many. I did not have a canopy bed, an uncluttered bedroom, and a perfectly de decorated living room the way my classmates did, or like the homes that I saw on TV. I had books piled high on shelves and tables, pipes, pens, oriental rugs, painted walls, and strange house guests. I was surrounded at home not only by some of the Western world's greatest scholars and writers, Noam Chomsky, Lillian Hellman, Norman Mailer, Jacques Derrida, Susan Sontag, Joan Didion, but by the creme de la creme of the Palestinian resistance. I know today there are probably lots of children of immigrants growing up similarly confused by the mixed messages of their lives pertaining to everything from class to culture to standards of beauty. For me, though, growing up the daughter of a Lebanese mother and a prominent Palestinian thinker in New York City in the 1980s and 90s was confusing and unsettling. I constantly questioned everything about who I was and where I fit in the world, constantly judged my own worthiness and compared myself to others, and I struggled desperately to find a way to reconcile the beautiful, comforting, loving world of my home, culture, and family with the supposed barbaric and backward place and society others perceived it to be. I wondered why I was an exception to the rule of, both, of what both Arabs and Americans were supposed to be like and why I was stuck in such an easy position, uneasy position. After years of trying to convince, desperately to convince people that they didn't really understand me or the place my family came from, I stopped trying, especially since there was never an, anyone around to make me feel less alone in my assertions. I resigned myself to believing that everything people said about my culture was true because it was exhausting and futile to try to convince anyone otherwise. Strangely, though, I also held on tightly to what I knew to be accurate and real about my family and culture. My parents and extended family are entirely responsible for that. I spent years simultaneously pushing them away and drawing them close until I found a place where I could exist together with them and completely apart from them. Letting go of the idea that I had to have one identity, one way to describe myself, one real me hasn't left me any less, less confused about who I am but it has certainly left me inspired, engaged, interested, complicated, and aware. And I'd rather be all of those things than just plain old American or plain old Arab. So that's, that's just the beginning. Everyone likes that part. That's great. That's wonderful. Thank you. You're welcome. Yes, thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> okay, uh, would anybody else like to... <clears throat> Can you hear like me? like to speak. Can you it hear sounds me? like a, is that Vincenzo? Yeah. Can you hear me? Not um, just very faintly. Let me turn up your volume. Yeah. There you go. Can you hear me right now? Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Um, hi. Thank you for your wonderful. Oh. 
presentation so far. Um, I have a question with regards to the memoir your father wrote in 2000s that I suppose it has been a big uh, event. I mean, not in your life maybe, but in the way in which he reworked his uh, memories, remember, remembrances from, from the past and from mm -hmm. that place. Uh, with which you, you, you are struggling and, and you struggle. So did it in some way influence what are you doing with what you did uh, with this book that you wrote right now or it was just like uh, your father's issue and uh, it didn't uh, have you anything mean, to do with you in some you way? Mean his book specific, his memoir specifically? Yeah. Out of place. Yeah. yeah, that's a good question. A lot of people ask me that because they think like, oh, it's the same thing. This insecure person who feels fat and ugly. <laughs> um, I think that when I, when my dad's memoir came out, I was already out of college. I think I was 25, 24, 25, and I was I didn't know any of the things in it. He'd never told me any of those. Um, for those who haven't read it, my father's memoir is called Out of Place, which is pretty clear what it means. Um, he grew up off just feeling the same way I did and I didn't know any of that and I was actually angry at him when I read the book because I thought well if you went to this American British schools and you felt left out and different and horrible about yourself why did you send me to this same environment? Um, and on the one hand I felt a sort of a kinship with him and a an empathy for him that I had never felt before, but on the other hand, I was a little bit angry that, like, why did it not occur to you? And to this day, my mom, you know, one thing that's very interesting is that my mom, people have asked, why did my parents not realize I was so tortured by my, you know, identity crisis um, and so ashamed of being Arab? And my mother said something very interesting, which in retrospect I think makes complete sense is that she she thought that and my father thought that my insecurity was more about class differences because you know my parents were not by any means poor but I lived on the poor side of town and my dad was a professor my grandparents helped pay for me and my brother to go to private school so we weren't rich and um, my friends were rich and they were a certain type of rich and they were blue-blooded American all came over on the Mayflower all you know and so I wanted to be part of their world and, and I I wasn't and I think that my parents very much they recognized that I wanted to live on the east side and I wished I was blonde and all this stuff but it, I think that they they really didn't understand that it was partly racism like I felt um, like I was dirty and hairy and gross and Arab and all of these things because my parents both grew up in the Middle East for the most part. Um, my dad came here when he was relatively young but they grew up around other people. My mom always says she didn't really realize um, even when we were kids that because she was always so proud of being Lebanese and being and she grew up there and she felt she had become a person there, so she was confident in who she was. And then we were born and raised here right at the time when all this stuff is happening and, you know, whether it was what was happening in Lebanon or, or just like the hostage crisis or the, even two years before I was born was the Olympics, you know, the Munich. And so th this was all new and it was just happening. So the idea of like Arabs, she was relatively new to this country and she was not fully aware um, of the popular conception of Arabs in America. So my parents didn't necessarily know what I was struggling with. Um, so yeah, so my dad's book, I read it when it came out and then I never read it again. And um, I think that the the sad part about it was I wish I'd known, I wish I'd known that how insecure my dad was because I only knew my dad as a grown-up who was a very successful person and if I had known how insecure and how lost he was when he was a kid I might have perhaps asked more questions as a young person and tried to find out more and been more interested in his world but I wasn't and that I think goes also has to do with the fact that I was a girl and he I was a little girl and as much as my dad loved me we didn't really talk about serious things very much I was just a little girl so um, I think that what what I tried to do was not look at his 
memoir at all because I knew that we had had such similar um, sort of psychological mechanisms going on, like such similar thoughts in our brain. I just thought it was more, it was fascinating to just write about my own. And I knew they were to overlap, but I didn't read the book. I read it when it came out. So I read it in 1998 or 99, and that was it. So I just, from memory, I knew the stories in the book, and I knew of its insecurities, but I didn't specifically set out to write um, in a similar way. I just was, I wanted other people to notice the similarities. Um, because again, that's another thing that doesn't, may not necessarily have to do with the fact that I was Palestinian or Lebanese. It may just happen to do with the fact that I'm my father's daughter, like, and we have a similar temperament, and that's why I was insecure, and that's why he was insecure, you know, and, and in that sense, I also wanted to sort of challenge the idea of, like, where's your identity from, you know? I got my identity because I'm, I have similar insecurities to my parents, because <laughs> it's genetic, you know? Thank you. And um, about like other um, writers who, especially female writers, who try to express your same uh, issues with your past and your heritage in, in memoirs or autobiography of, well, <laughs> realistic or uh, fiction, uh, is there somebody that um, gave you ideas or a model? Well, beyond Toni Morrison, as you already said. No, um, actually, it's interesting. The first, the one book I did read to when I first got my book contract was Rebecca Walker's book. Do you know? Um, yes. John of Alice Walker. It's called White, Black, Black, White, and Jewish. And mm -hmm. actually, she had the same editor, I think, on that book as I do. So I thought, oh, this is the only book that's going to be anything like mine. So I read it. And then I had a nervous breakdown because it was just so different. Um, because she has a lot of anger toward her mom, which was not what I was doing. And then she had this this terribly difficult upbringing where her dad was white and Jewish, and her mom was black and this famous, you know, intellectual. And she would go to. They decided that for two years she'd live with the mom, and then two years she'd live with the dad. So every two years she would go to a different, you know. California or the East Coast, she would go back and forth, and she was either fin trying to fit in as a Jewish girl or trying to fit in as a black girl. And I thought, oh, this is going to be the most similar, but I actually found that more confusing because that was her story. Um, um, I think I was intimidated by the idea of being the daughter of an intellectual, so I thought this would be the perfect story. This would be the perfect person. But our personalities are so completely different. And her coming of age, her book is a lot more about, you know, how she used her, her sexuality and, and her anger at her parents. And it's just very different. So I, I very much admire her and looked at her work. Um, but it actually made me more confused. And I decided to just go ahead and write my own thing um, regardless of, of what it was supposed to be like because I was almost disappointed in myself when I read her book because I didn't it seemed more erudite and more like polished and more well written than mine would be so I just it was intimidating but um, I do very much um, now I mean now I'm more able to sort of explore and read about and think about other people's stuff but I didn't when I was working so one last question question if I can. Sure. Uh, the, the, so writing your book and looking for Palestine has been a process of uh, understanding where you come from or, or what you are right now or both or something different. I mean what what is Palestine now for you and what was before the book? Um, before the book I didn't know what it was. I mean like, yeah, I didn't know. And now I still don't know, but I do, and I say this at the end, so I don't want to give away the ending, but uh, my dad, for my dad, Palestine was an idea. It was, a, it was, it was not a, a geographical place. It was an idea. It was a, he, I think he said, like, it's a touchstone uh, for human rights. And that, that was what it represented to him, was that, it was a very 
simple. It was like any other, it was like South Africa, it was like any of these other timeless stories that we identify with so readily about people should be treated equally. And it was constantly, and it still is constantly, uh, you know, excused and explained away. And no, no, it's not exactly like that. And the reality was it is. And that's why it was important to him to talk about it and to keep saying, like, these are people. These are human beings. Um, so even if he didn't believe in nationalism and necessarily want there to be a country called Palestine that he wanted to live in and he didn't want to go back and have a house and, you know, the house that he, my father was not attached to property and land at all. That's not who he was. He was attached to the idea of, of you know, humanity and, and equality. And so to me that's what asserting that I'm Palestinian is and will always be. You know, and, and to this day, on the Upper West Side of Manhattan, where everyone's Jewish, I constantly tell them, let's go on a plane together, and we'll go to Israel, and you'll get in, and I will not, and they will search me, and, and meanwhile, you still think of me as your friend. And so, you know, that, that's why it's important, I think. That's what it is now. I still don't know what it means, whether it's a place, I mean, culturally, I feel confused, but... But in terms of when I say that or talking about it, the reason I talk about it and say that word out loud is because it's as it's as important as anything else. And and I also noticed when I did my play, my play was called Palestine, and people were freaking out about it. And I realized how people have less trouble with the word Palestinian than they do with the word Palestine. And that also annoyed me. It's as if no one wants to give it um, space. To exist, and that bothers me, and so it makes me want to say, um, to to sort of engage people on it. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, so we had we had a question here from uh, uh, from a GKS student, uh, Zachary Little. Um, he, he he was just sort of uh, in a in a general sense wanted to know your views about assimilationism and uh, active versus passive assimilation. Um, and for me, just to ad lib into this question just a little bit, um, one question that I uh, that I've heard brought up around that topic is, um, in some ways, there 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 is a pressure to assimilate uh, for people coming from outside of the U.S. But on the other hand, there's also, uh, in some cases, there's this assumption that some people are unassimilable, right. and therefore, uh, and therefore, in some ways, you know, it's not simply a question of uh, of resisting assimilation or um, or uh, <clears throat> or uh, passively giving into it, but really something else than that. And so, I don't know. Just leave it up to you to uh, respond well, to. Well, this is sort of interesting. I think in my personal um, life, I struggle with this more than one of the things I do is I start off the book by saying I grew up as a Jew in New York because. Um, when people meet me, they're very strong. I mean, my friend, one of my best friends calls me Woody Allen. That is my shtick. I am like, oh, my life is horrible. Everything is terrible. So, um, and then there's also this stereotype of a New Yorker who, because I speak in a certain way and act a certain way and, and, and worry about certain things, I must be Jewish. So I wanted to also not just make sure that Jews would read my book, which was certainly part of it, um, but I also wanted to make sure that I made clear that that's a part of my identity. Part of my identity is a Jewish New Yorker. Whatever that, that's a made-up construct anyway. So this idea that you're this like Jerry Seinfeld and you're like worried about stupid things and, and you spend hours having anxiety attacks about, I mean for me it's ironic, it's like silly because I have like, I moved into this apartment and there was a mezuzah on the door and I had an anxiety attack about taking it down because I thought then everyone would think I, would, I was anti-Semitic and I hated Jews and I'm like, well, you know, it's, it's funny and it's ironic because it's, you know, I'm being a neurotic Jew about not being a Jew. Um, but the reality is, like, that persona is an identity. It's a construct. Um, so you could be Jewish but be from Louisiana and not have those um, characteristics that I have, that people identify as Jewish. And so for me, um, that was important, first of all. Um, and then, but then it goes the other way as well, which is this, thing that I struggle with and think about a lot, which is, and I write about um, uh, in the book, like these ideas of um, culture, like 
there are certain things about Arab culture that are embedded in who I am. Uh, so my father used to say, you really romanticize your friends. I don't know why I expect so much for them, from them. Americans are not like that. And I would never, I never understood what he meant, and now I sort of do. There's a, there's a certain way that we love. I mean, everyone always wants to talk about how, how Arabs hate. So I personally, there's a way that we love. And the expectations of loyalty and love and, um, you know, and community are very different. And it almost sounds like Orientalist to even say that, but it's also a fact. And it's a very difficult part of my, um, my daily struggles in this culture. Even though I was born and raised here, I was raised by people who have different, a different way, just it's inherent, a different way of thinking and caring about people. And I and certainly there are very, very nice, very empathetic, very lovely Americans. It's not that. It's just that sometimes I can't reconcile the way that I think I would handle a situation that's presented to me and the way that someone who's not from my cultural background would. And so there are those things that, you know, my mother and I, this is funny, it's in the book, my mother has lived here for 50 years and she basically uses Yiddish words all the time because she's, even though she has a Lebanese accent, because she's that much of a New York Jew, <laughs> but at the same time, she doesn't really get this culture, and she doesn't get. She certainly doesn't identify it in any way as a Jewish person, but she has these like signifying things that people that people latch onto. And so, um, I forget what the question was, but <laughs> I'm sure I answered it. Well, well, part of the question was was just like, you know, is it really just a matter of a of, of a similar, or what are your views on a similar? on assimilation. Uh, well, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I'm not really sure. Yeah. Um, I, I think about it sometimes, like, my mom is pretty much assimilated. She's lived here for a really long, but she still has an accent. She uses expressions funny. And when she goes to Lebanon and she's speaking Arabic, it almost seems that she has a different personality when she's speaking Arabic. Almost like in Lebanon, I feel like she's a different person, and I can't really explain that. But I, I don't, you know, I don't know what assimilation really is. I think that there are people who, who come here and they don't lose their accent, and they, and they don't, um, and they don't, you know, necessarily stop eating the same food. You know, my mo my mom's probably one of those people. She she doesn't not eat American food, but she prefers to eat the food that she like Arabic food and so there's that but I mean she also does when my father died the last thing she wanted to do was move back to Lebanon and be like a widow in Lebanon she's like I'm gonna stay in New York it's where my friends are I want to go to the opera I want to do so it's like I don't know what you would consider assimilation and then of course there's like and it would also depend of course on you know what part of the country we're talking we're talking about exactly. if we're talking about the upper I, yeah and my parents are very um mm -hmm. I think people always say they're very, they seem more European, right? So in the, in the idea of, a, this is part of my discomfort with the Arab American um, label, that implies to a lot of people a traditional Muslim. So like they'll do these things like, you know, those YouTube things like shit Arab Americans say or like, you know, you're Lebanese if, and then it's always off, it's pretty much more often than not builds around the premise of being Muslim. And I'm not Muslim. I'm not really Christian either, but I'm not Muslim. So Islam is part of my culture, and I never denied that, and my parents always in, in, you know, insisted that that was a reality and that it was something I should be proud of, but I'm not Muslim, so I don't, I don't know what, what it's like to be the daughter of parents who don't want you to go on a date with, you know, like all these bizarre, you know, a lot of his class too. I just... That, so assimilation to me is just something I, I just just such a weird idea. I don't know. I'm not really sure how to. And then there the there's like political like there's a lot of Arab Americans. Um, at least until recently, they were mostly um, Republican, and everyone would be surprised by that. And then it, you know most of them were immigrants who came here and they did well. Like it's the general immigrant story. So like I'm American. America has done so much for me. I don't want to 
be taking care of other poor people. I want people to work hard because that's what I did. So, you know, there's different ways of looking at assimilation. So there's that, like, I'm American now, and I do what America wants, and I would want what's best for America. And then there's the, you know, my parents or me who look, sounds, and acts pretty much American, but my politics and my, um, you know, my allegiance to the language and culture and food and well-being of the people from where my parents come from, um, it just very, it's very strong. <coughs> Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, all right. Well, let's uh, let's have uh, maybe one or two more questions from um, students, and then we'll wrap it up for today. Um, let's see. Uh, it looks like Sarah Jacob just came on, and I know I, it, it, Wen Young. Did you want to pose a question before we go? Um, sure. <clears throat> no problem. I was wondering um, throughout this. So you also think that um, you keep talking about you know being Christian and being. Muslim, but there's also like a secular humanist aspect to this. So, um, yeah, that's yeah. pretty much what I am. I mean, sorry, go on. No, no, no. Um, I, I, I think I, I'm trying to understand this um, from from both an intellectual and empathic level. So, um, it's do you view it something as similar to politics? Like somebody can be religious about um, political norms as well. Something like that. Well, for me, I should probably, I probably didn't make this clear. In the beginning of the book, I, I lay it out the way I lay it out because I'm trying to make clear that this was what was given to me as my options for my identity. Are you Christian? Are you Jewish? Are you Muslim? Are you white? Are you black? Are you Arab? Are you Puerto Rican? Whatever. Are you yes, the east side or the west? These are what was handed to me. And I found that I fit into none of them. And so one thing that happened would be, like, people assume I'm Muslim. And then when I would say, no, I'm not Muslim, I would say, I'm, my family's Christian. And then they would say, oh, you're Christian. And then another set of assumptions comes in, especially because my mother is from Lebanon. And Lebanese Christians hate Palestinians. So, oh, my God, your parents hate each other. No. My, parent, my mom is actually Quaker. And then regardless of that, she's secular and she's a humanist. And so it was and her parents were that way. And my dad is a secular humanist. So the tradition of my family is a Christian tradition, but like we identified as secular, but I always end up, so that's what I do. So you end up, you end up creating your identity by defending the thing that people assume you are. So like, well, people will assume you're Muslim and I'll say, no, we're not Muslim. And I'm just doing that to just be like, oh, you know, you can't just assume that. No. But there's this whole level of, because your family is also this, and they identify it, some of it is passed on to you. Yeah. So you can identify with some of it as well, but you don't know if, if the label that they, the other people are seeking is what you identify with, if the right. idea is the same. Exactly. And that, that, that's very good. Exactly. Oh, thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Great. Thank you. Um, uh, Sarah, did you, have, did you have a question you wanted to post? Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yes, Hi. hello. Hello. Thank you, Najla. Thank you. Wow. Um, I, um, I grew up in England uh, to Indian Jews. Wow. Uh, Indian, and my mum's side were uh, Iraqi, Iraqi Jews. Wow. So, <laughs> so I, had, I, I can really relate to everything you're saying in terms of who right. am I. I don't quite fit into any category, you know, and you kind of have to choose that. And so I became, I, I think, primarily British mm -hmm. in my persona, right? But I had a distinct uh, feeling of inferiority when I was growing up. Yeah. Is that something that you you would yeah. say you experienced? Exactly. That's exactly, and that's what I write about in the book, which is this, like, yeah. idea that I was somehow passing, and I write about this a lot. I got to pass. I mean, most people still think, oh, people still think I'm Jewish. And somehow that gives me a pass in New York City um, because they're confused how I'm Palestinian, but somehow I still seem Jew. You know, these things. Um, and then inside I would feel like, but I'm a fraud because if, if they really knew, like I look and I act like this person that they know, but inside I'm the person that they hate kind of thing. 
Um, right. Right. So it was. It was. It was more like that. Um, and it, and nobody was. And you will see this if you read the book. Nobody was like outwardly mean to me. It was mainly like I was just very sensitive, and I picked up on things. And of course, because of the home that I grew up in, you know, when little things happened and my parents would make comments like, oh, it's because you're Arab, that's why they picked on you, you know, and they were just kidding, but I took it seriously, so um, there's that as well, it's just, you know, mostly for me it was an idea that I was this horrible thing that I needed to hide, and, uh, and yet, I, to me, it didn't feel like a horrible thing, it was the one thing that made me feel connected and loved and happy, and I wanted to figure out a way to to tell everyone else that, like, it's not, no, we're really nice, you know, just I'm talking as a little girl. Uh, it was hard, because I was being told on the outside that it was made me less, and but what I felt was that it made me whole, so I didn't really understand. Right, right. Wonderful, thank you. You're welcome. All right. Well, thank you so much, Najla, for uh, joining us today. It's been really great. And um, I'll, I'll send you the, 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 the YouTube link after this is finished. And great. But, yeah, we, we appreciate it very much. And uh, so um, so that, that'll be pretty much the end of today. And um, uh, just to remind people, we will be... Um, we will be having uh, Gayatri Chakravarti's feedback on Saturday at 10 o'clock p.m. on uh, Can I Turn and Speak? Um, and we will be uh, having a, a special session to consider Edward Said's um, uh, the, the introductions to two books, to cultural imperialism and uh, also um, Orientalism. And uh, we'll, we'll announce when that's going to be um, shortly. But um, so anyway, thank you very much for joining us. And, uh, thank you. All right. Great. Bye. Okay. Good night. Bye. Bye. See you later.